There we go. So, um, what do we have in this problem? So, this is differentials. We're using this to estimate the amount of paint put on the silo, right? What do we know about the silo? Okay, 60 feet tall, right? And we've got this dome on top of it. And it's got a radius of, right? But I'm going to call that R because radius is going to change as I add a little to it, right? Very little, but a little change, right? And same up here on the dome. When you add that little thickness of paint to it, it's going to increase in radius, right? So we've got this silo here. Of course, uh, so what is the volume silo? Well, there's a cylinder part and a dome part. Okay. okay, so here's the cylinder part. That's exactly right. And we've got this dome part, which is the hemisphere. So this is the cylinder part. And this is the dome. Over it. Now, my R can change as I add the paint to it. But I'm going to go ahead and plug in 60 for the height. Right. So let's improve this. This is 60 times R squared. Now, what are we doing when we paint this thing? We're basically adding a very small a tenth of an inch to the radius, right? Um, initial R 12 feet, and then add one tenth of an inch of paint. Which is actually one over 120. But I only go ahead and make sure I'm okay with it. That's the part that I was trying to show you. Well, one inch is 12 a foot, right? And then you've got a tenth of that, right? So it's a tenth of the 12, which is one over 20. You could just straight up go with unit conversion too. If you're ever confused about this, you've got one tenth of an inch, right? And let's see, you need to cancel out here. Inches to feet. Let's see, I guess it's 12 inches to one foot, right? So now the inches cancel, and I get one over 120. See how we. So that'll all work. Yes. Right, because let me exaggerate how thick my paint is. Um, I'll put this one here. Gross scary volume. All right. So how much, what I'm trying to do is figure out the volume of paint, right? They still paint by the gallon or the cubic foot or whatever. How would I estimate how much paint it takes to paint this? Well, this has a certain amount of volume. And then I slather on, like, say, an inch of paint on this, right? How much paint do I have? New volume, fat painted guy, minus the original volume, right? So it's a change in volume is what the paint is. Everybody okay with it? But that's actually for this thing that's hard to compute exactly, but it's pretty easy to estimate using differentials. Uh, and let's do that. So we're going to assume the change in volume. This is exactly the amount of paint that we need from swelled up silo with paint on it, subtracted from the original silo. That's a change in volume. That's the amount of paint we need. Hard to compute, 
So we're going to approximate it by dB, which in this case is 120 pi r plus 2 pi r squared all times dB. So, um, uh, now is Let's do that. And that'll give me the number. So in this case, I'm here. 120 uh, times R, which is 12, plus 2 uh, 12 squared, 120. And this should be complete. So that's going to be the 120 against 12 pi. And let's see, that's going to be 24 to 10. 12 minus 2 is 5. So this is about 14.45 cubic feet. And actually, it's kind of interesting, right? Because this seems like a pretty standard size for a silo. But I guess that's the challenge I have to look at the volume for average. Yeah, so that's about 40. That's like, that's like roughly 45 cubic feet of paint. Uh, and if we assume the paint weighs as much as water, I suspect it weighs more, right? Uh, but even if it's only water, Uh, yeah, you're looking at like 2,800 pounds, I think. Right, so it's over a ton of paint, even at a tenth of an inch thick, which you put on the side of the right? Uh, overestimate or underestimate. So I think the last part of the question was something like. If you actually go down to the paint store and get exactly that much paint, is it going to be enough, or too much, or exactly right to cover your silo? Yeah. So it's in our Well, how are you tell? So you need a little bit more here. So let me. Uh, so here's what we have. The original function was B equals 65 R squared plus two thirds pi R cubed, right? So this is like a cubic or quadratic, it's a cubic function, but we get that quadratic term as well, right? Now, uh, we've already taken the derivative of this. Uh, 120 pi r plus 2 pi r squared. That's the first derivative. And the second derivative is 120 pi plus 4 pi. This reflects the concavity. Um, so they're saying it like they're like the positive. Right, so what this means is you don't have to do anything beautiful here. In the range that we care about, like R is approximately 12, this function is increasing and smiling, right? Because it's the derivative is positive and this is positive. So it's something like that. And what you have actually done when you do this is you use a tangent line to approximate. Uh, the curve, right? Okay. And so, because of the concavity, uh, 
what happens is, is you know, the tangent line actually lies below the curve. And so using this thing to estimate the amount of pain, you're going to come up a little bit short. So if you buy exactly this amount of pain, you can't quite get the pain of it in the next day. But my guess is that the size of this and the only one that's in the next day, it will be almost unnoticed. So like how many years? How many years? Stop doing that so much. How are you doing it? How many years? No way. It's because I did do that in my head. Yeah. Have to think about the time having. Is the tangent line under or over the curve? So is it going to give an estimate that's too low? So I, I think. Okay, other questions? Okay, so today we start the last section uh, before the exam tomorrow. And this is, this looks like a total like non secular or something, but the truth of the matter is, um, this is going to be incredibly useful uh, in the next chapter. And I'm going to show you kind of my applications. Uh, okay, that's a little warm up here. What's the derivative of v to the x? Good. Derivative of x squared. Mm -hmm. Cosine x. Cosine x. And how about this? This is confusing my side of the brain. Now, you do it first. Can you think of something whose derivative is equal to x? How about this? Oh, you're on the right side. Okay, so what is it? One half. Same power. Well, let's see. Does that work out fine? What happens if you get rid of this? It'll be the third. Right. You need to do the third power because you drop the power down here. And is the one half right? There you go. There you go. Well, see what happens when you take the derivative of this. Uh, oh, uh, right. You take the derivative of this, brings the three down, you can't splash. You okay with that? How about something for the derivative? Okay. But derivative of sine is different. How about some of the derivative is x to one half? Let's get the power rate first. What, what are you supposed to power rate? Let's get the Well, every time you take the derivative of power back, it drops by one. Right. So if you want to end up at a half, you best be starting at one and a half. Agree? But this doesn't quite work. The power is right, but it's three halves x to the one half, right? Fix it. This is like a cheap trick, right? Put a two thirds there, and that cancels, and then you get extra. Uh, 
uh, when you want the power to equal one half, see, notice this is one times x one half. So I want the number out in front to be one. And that's why I needed to adjust it by two thirds, but it depends. And so this section is called anti derivatives. We are going to explore in the next chapter something called the fundamental theorem of calculus. And it is, one can argue, the big reason why anybody cares about calculus in the first place. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's incredibly powerful. And we need antiderivatives for this. Uh, now, how many of you feel like you've gotten pretty warm and fuzzy with derivatives, like taking derivatives, right? You can do all kinds of things with derivatives, right? Uh, you know the derivatives, the trig functions, powers of x, et cetera, et cetera. And the chain rule, and the quotient rule, and the product rule, and all this kind of thing. You can even take logs if you need to. You want to take the derivative x dx. Taking derivatives in a certain sense is easy. It's an algorithmic process. Finding antiderivatives, maybe that's hard right there. Some, th some things are fairly easy. What's that? I'm sorry, what do you mean? Uh, yes, theory. I, I'm not going to make it too hard. Uh, but you will see, in a certain sense, for, for certain functions of yeah, this is not a difficult process. Let me actually give you a definition and then we'll talk about this. Definition. Uh, that f of x be the function find on uh, an interval nine. We say capital F of x is an derivative of f. Yeah, f prime of x. So an antiderivative, very simply put, is somebody put a reverse here on the derivative. You go backwards. Instead of taking the function and saying, what's its derivative? You take the function and say, who has derivative that is equal to this function? Right? So you're just running the process in reverse. Uh, so here's a notational convention uh, for an antiderivative. Uh, sometimes uh, it's common to go from lowercase to uppercase and talk about the antiderivative. We would use this notation, but this notation may look strange to you at some point. Uh, and we're going to do something. Uh, in the beginning of chapter five, it uses this notation that was looking something different, but it's not the whole explanation. But this symbol here looks like kind of snake ds, uh, f of x dx, and dx just signifies that you're aware of the x. So for right now, you can just consider that a thing. So for example, Now, remember, all you got to do is think of one example so far. Uh, this just means the derivative of this should be the function you find under this sometimes called an interval. But 
favorite. You think of another antiderivative of sine x? Something else other than negative cosine x is derivative is sine x. I can think of a, a cheap way to get a whole bunch of sine x. The derivative of negative cosine is sine. Are we in agreement on that? What else has derivative sine? I'll give you again just to adjust this a little bit. <laughs> of course, cosine negative x is actually cosine x, but if you're thinking, how about this? How about cosine x plus one? Right? See, I told you it was kind of a cheap trick, right? Cosine x plus one, cosine x plus seven, cosine x plus 14. How about this? Cosine x plus any constant. Well, what? Sometimes I can get a little tricky. Can anybody think of a function whose derivative is not even guess, but equal to two x? I understand where you're going with that, but the derivative of b to the x squared is e to the x squared times two x. You always have that power of these same. So this has got to be something like e to the 2x. But this isn't quite right, is it? Because what's the derivative of e to the 2x? What is the derivative of e to the 2x? e to the 2x times 2. So the derivative of this is 2 times 2 big, right? Now the derivative of this is one half e to two x times two, two and the one half cancel. Okay, I'm gonna run a blue light special right now. Somebody give me a thing. You're, you're tempted to kind of think like this. Remember your stat in the previous one? Right, but the problem is you get that extra two x up. If you can get this, if you can give me an antiderivative of this. Doesn't fall right down to two of these things. Put on a piece of paper, slip it to me. I'll give you an A. You can walk out right now and the rest of the course. Tell me the anti I'll give you an A. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I hedge my best carefully. This does have an anti -drug. And here it is. But you cannot write the fact it was proved. In the 17th derivative. This ain't a derivative. I can show you what the function looks like, but you cannot write it down in terms of only. You can't write it as products, uh, compositions, quotients, uh, sines, cosines, exponentials, laws, polynomials. It cannot be done. It is there, just you can't write it down. And in fact, this, an adjustment of this is actually how many of you have heard of the bell curve? Things that are used in statistics, this kind of thing, normal distributions, or these kind of things, right? This is a very simple in all that things. And you cannot write it down. So the moral of the story is taking the derivative of this, that's something that is now more or less routine. But actually being able to write down an antiderivative of this closed form, it is there. It's just we're limited on what we can write down. We're going to find ways to use this, but you just can't write it in terms of geometry. 
In fact, I'm going to go one step further. Even though it's harder to write down antiderivatives, and this is why I say there's an art to it, right? And some things you just can't do it. It is easier for a function to have an antiderivative. Anybody, let me take you back to the old days, 1040. Can anybody give me an example of a function that is continuous everywhere, but it's not differentiable? I can absolutely think of an example. Right. So let me let me give you something that's a little bit more elaborate, right? This function right here, if I were to draw this. This one just became a uh, But there's a number of places that we're ready to go with this, namely quite right here, this engine refer. Right? And right here, I've got a cuss. And maybe right here, the pink line particle. And at all these little pointy places, there's no grid. So there's at least two, four, six, eight. So there's at least nine points on this where there's no grid. However, any continuous function, all of them have an antiderivative. In fact, this one right here will have an antiderivative. In fact, it's antiderivative. No, it will be continuous. So let's be practical uh, and do some computations to kind of get you uh, get you all kind of used to this a little bit. Um, so this part, let's, let's just kind of. To have some fun with this. Let's see. Uh, let's find some antiderivatives. Uh, right. How about we play around with this a little bit? Uh, let's get serious. We've done this for a couple of years. We found the antiderivative of x to the one half early. We mucked around with it. We got it. We found the antiderivative of um, x squared. Let's stop fooling around. Let's just do everything. Now, I know what the derivative is. Remind me, what's the derivative of this? Agree, agree. Put that in reverse. By the way, when you took the derivative of this, it dropped the power by one. Okay. So, what do you think the antiderivative? What, what do you think the power of x should be? I agree with that. But this uh, x in plus one by itself, naked, doesn't seem to work. Right. And the problem is, when you take the derivative of this, yes, you've got the right power, but oops, you're going to have an n plus one out in front. Oh, yes, yeah. There you go. And that'll cancel it out. Plus cancel. Now, here's the great thing about antiderivatives when you do the homework in the section or whatever. Here's the great thing. There'll be a lot of problems saying, find my anti, find the antiderivative, find the antiderivative, and you write it down. You never have to use the book back in your book. And here's why. These are always checkable. Take your answer and take its derivative. If you got back where you started, I don't care what the book says, you're right. Right? If you take the derivative of this, you get back where you started, it's, it's correct. These are all checkable. And it's easier to take a derivative than an antiderivative. So when you get something wonky, take its derivative. Get back where you started. It's correct. Period. Oh, by the way, though, now that I've bragged about our ability to do this, I look at my formula here and I see that there is a problem. There is definitely my formula a problem to look out for. And what is that? Yeah, uh, very good. So, this 
this seems to have some problems here when n is equal to negative one because so what is the negative one case? <clears throat> of something whose derivative is one over x. Yeah, I've got I've got every power of x covered except for the one over x, the x to the minus one power. Anybody figure out? Anybody recall a function whose derivative happens to be one over x? There you go. And I'm going to make this a little bit more general. Actually, I can make it more general than that. And I'll discuss that later. Y'all remember that this is derivative with the natural log of the absolute value of x. So now, hey, look, I've got it like all my powers of x recovered. If n is not equal to negative one, it's that. And when n is negative one, it's a log. Okay. Um, how about this? Somebody tell me um, what's a function derivative is sine. Okay. okay, and how about something whose derivative is cosine sine. Um, this is proper notation for a romantic. You might think of something whose derivative is tangent. Sine and cosine were fairly easy. Tangent seems to be more of a So this is intuitive, but I'm, I want to make this kind of approaches a little bit more concrete when we get into chapter five. But that's what that's what tangent is, right? Okay. Um, Again, I'm, it may have looked like I pulled that out of some orifice, but let's check if this is correct. What is the derivative? So the derivative of this, and hopefully taking the derivative will show you what my thought process is. Derivative of natural log of blah, I'm sorry, derivative of natural log of the absolute value block is one of the blocks, right? So far, what do I got to multiply? So see, look, I've already got part of my fraction. And now what do I got to multiply by the derivative of cosine? This derivative of cosine minus sine x minus is canceled. So this is or another way to write this is natural on secant of x. By the way, you all see the connection here to here. Right. I took that negative sign and pulled it up here, making it a power because one of the cosines. So, uh, check this. Get one over C, and I'm seeing tangent. So that's good. Um,
This one's tricky. We get to use substitutions. I'll derive this one, but it requires an, an incredible amount, in my opinion, of uh, intuition. Oh, actually, let me warm up here. This one's easy. If you think about it, if anybody think of a function whose derivative is secant squared. Very good, very good. Y'all remember that derivative tangent of secret squared? Now remove that square power. Let's claim that C. That's a decent guess, but unfortunately, you start doing the chain rule and you see you run into problems. There's no reason that you're ever going to guess this. Uh, I'll, I'll show you how this comes to the conclusion later. Right, that was your next guess, right? But see, let me make a point here. So here I just kind of wrote this down like I knew what I'm doing, right? What I'm going to let's check it. Just to make sure that old gentleman remember this antiderivative. So okay. Good old exercise in the old fashioned kind of thing. Derivative of log of the absolute value of blob is one over blob. Do I agree with that? So, the first step one over secant x plus tan x. Okay. What do I got to do now? What's the sign? Uh, but remember, group secant. Secant x tangent x. How about the group tangent x? Square x. Now notice. That right here as a factor of secant. So this is one over secant x plus tangent x times I'm going to pull secant out here on the right, leaving me with tangent x plus secant x. Then look what happens. These cancel, leaving me nothing. This actually shows, I think, it sort of demonstrates in a certain sense why antiderivatives are much, much harder than derivatives. Because you probably can't anticipate this factoring out that happened to cancel the derivative. Where does this come from? Again, when we get, when we get to new substitution, I'll probably come out of this. Okay, any questions? Okay, so let me uh, pop it there. Uh, and I think that you all probably will not be too shocked about this. Um, but FX. Interval I and uh, but that's the derivative.
So what this says is, this is kind of a magical theorem. Because what it says is, supposing the function is defined on some interval and you find its antiderivative. If you found one of them, you found them all. Right? It should be fairly clear that E x of x plus C is an antiderivative. Because when you take the derivative of big F, you get little f. And if you take the derivative of big F plus constant, you get little f again because the constant goes away. The magic of this theorem is this is it. There's nothing else working in the shadow. This is the only antiderivative. Uh, and I want to show you this is true uh, because it's easy and I can do it. And if the next slide is something that we've seen before. What? F of x and big G of x both be antiderivatives. <laughs> so suppose I just pick two of them, F of x and G of x. This means that F prime of x. That fact, this is also the capital G problem. Does anybody remember back when we did the mean value here? What can you say about two functions that have the same derivative on the interval? They vary by constant. Let me take this one step further. Notice that what happens what's the derivative of f which is an f of x minus f of x, which is a big fat zero. So this is a function whose derivative is zero on an interval. Remember back when we did the mean value theorem? What can you say about a function on an interval whose derivative is always zero? That function must be, it has to be constant. By the value theorem, f of x minus g of x is constant. Uh, actually, I don't know if g of x is minus f of x, but anyway, this means g of x is f of x minus c. And so what we've said is any two antiderivatives varied by a constant. Sorry about the minus there. Okay. Any questions? Questions? Okay, let me give you a, a little. Yes.
y'all remember what this is? This is um, one of Bragg's. This works, but this can be made with them. Let me ask you this, one over X function itself, where is it defined? Where is one over X defined? Everywhere except zero. So if you have an interval containing zero, so the most general antiderivative of this is log x on this side plus c log x on this side. But if you look holistically at everything, actually you can do this. I can do it a little bit more general than this. This is not your log x on the right back, c1. Natural log absolute value factor two. So I can use one constant on the right side of zero uh, and another constant on the left side of zero. But so, and the deal is, is this thing is a continuous everywhere. So if zero is contained, then when you do two different things in the zone of zero, because it's there and it says on an interval. So I'm not going to pick that in too much, but I think it's in there. So you notice there's actually a more general line type of area than that of one of the X. Okay. Questions? So in this theorem, Suppose f of x and g of x both have antiderivatives. You know, earlier in 1040 and earlier in this course, there are some theorems that I, I would start out by saying suppose that f is a different Suppose that you can take the derivative of this etc. This is a less restrictive condition. Right. Um, in fact, you don't even have to be continuous to be um, to have an anthem. Uh, it, it's actually pretty loose. Let me make clear that e to the x squared has an antiderivative. Right. I want to make that distinction yet again. Right. I said. It's the one where I said I give you an A in the class, you can write it down. You just can't write it down in closed form in terms of elementary function. Let me tell you what the antiderivative of x squared is. There it is. Right. I, I'm just going to have to call it. This is a function. Uh, it's got, but actually, very nice properties. You just can't write it down other than a function. So, suppose f and g are any two functions that have antiderivatives. Number one, That is to take the antiderivative of constant times your function, it's constant times the antiderivative. And two, you want to take the antiderivative of sum of two functions. You can just break this up. And that's good. Because the derivative of this is f of x plus g of x, and the derivative of this is the derivative, which is f of x plus the derivative of this is g of x. Right? 
this might be a good demonstration. What's the anhedra in the What's the anhedra in 45 minutes? So I can pull that 45 out just keep it in The antiderivative of the 45 cosine x is 45 cosine x x is 45 sine x. Is that No, because Drew sounds close. Does that clear it up? Yeah, so this, this just means you can break up sums, and this means that you can pull out. Now, unfortunately, I don't think you're going to be able to write the integral or the antiderivative of f of x times p of x is the antiderivative of f times the antiderivative of g. What's going to screw up there? That's exactly right. It's the product rule that goes in. And uh, so finding finding the antiderivative product of two functions is already starts getting so difficult. And we'll we'll talk about that later. Um, so let's uh, let's look at this. I don't know about you guys, but I've always wondered what is the function of the derivative of the C squared x plus x one squared, C cube root of x plus x four plus seven x squared plus three x one or x squared. Always wonder that. Keeps me up at time. So I'm figuring out what what let me take maybe one step before I start trying to do the antiderivative, kind of cleaning this thing up. A little bit. Anybody make any suggestions on how I might clean this up, like make it a bit more useful for public consumption? Ah, good, good, good. Uh, and there's one more thing, which is more minor. I rewrote this to do So I'm going to rewrite this. 17. I love your idea. Use the algebra to help, right? This looks like death on a hot plate, right? Let's rewrite it. X4 over X squared is X squared. 7 X squared over X squared is 7. This is 3 over x with 3x to the minus 1 power plus x to the minus 2. Everybody see what I did? The only thing I really did is I rewrote this fractional power of an x, and then I've got four things in my numerator, but only one in my denominator. So I wrote that as four separate fractions and kind of reduced it. Everybody cool with that? And now I see what seven things up there, and I can do all their antiderivatives. Uh, somebody remind me what's the antiderivative of secant squared? What's something that's derivative? And, and there's a seven. So, 
Be careful though, this isn't a natural law. And I'll I'll tell you, it looks like you see some people. I had made X there if it wouldn't be anybody remember a function Uh you're close. Our tangent, right? Remember the derivative of the inverse tangent is one over one plus x squared, right? So this should be eight times the inverse tangent of x. And the rest of this should be smooth sailing. But everything else is out of bags. Because here, the derivative of the Bell Mountain. Every other thing that I've got in here is a power of x. I've got a formula for this. This should be, uh, and so I'll write this out kind of explicitly. This will be x to the one third and once. This will be x to the four thirds, all over four thirds. This should be x to the three, all over three. This should be seven x. Oh, what about x to the minus one power? Well, there's a special case. Don't let your thinking get locked in. It's an antiderivative x minus one. It's wrong. Right. Remember the minus one power can You know, you notice that it had a zero in the denominator, right? It should be x zero over zero. It's like, oops. And this. Should be x to the minus one over minus one, and then the obligatory plus c. So I'll clean this up a little bit. Just fun. Take the derivative of this, massage it a little bit. What you get. Any questions? You're telling me this I understand the second line. Where you get the x ray on it, you explain that part because I know it's from that. So this is x four over x squared plus seven x squared over x squared plus three x over x squared plus one. Right. right. And then I'll reduce them all x squared, seven. 3 over x and x minus 2. Okay. Uh, well, for now, yeah. If you want to write the most general answer, which is that's usually kind of an expectation. How many of you, uh, how many of you in your future, um, I guess it's to be on. how many of you have, uh, have to say that 28? Some people here talk about four different equations. Uh, you know enough now to me to tell you the different equations. Um, these come up very naturally. 
uh, all over the place. So I, I'm just going to give you very basic stuff here. Uh, a differential equation. Is a function of y, a function of x, uh, and some of its derivatives. Okay, so any function that you want to write this like uh, y prime squared plus uh, y double prime equals x uh, y y triple prime plus y squared plus this is this is an equation involving an unknown function of x called uh, y. So we we got some function. When you take its derivative and square it, add it to its second derivative, it's x times the function times the third derivative plus the square root of the cosine x. And I'll try to solve this, right? This is just one I made up. Differential equations in general, like if I make something random like this, are extremely hard, if not impossible to solve. Uh, it's certainly in close form. But some easy ones. So let me give you a um, differential equation. You all may have seen this. Did you all do a section on exponential growth and decay? And you're in for this. So did you look at like radioactive path lines, things like this? So let me give you a couple of examples. Here's where a differential equation might show up. Left, T, time. And y of t equals the number of deer somehow. Okay, so here's a very naive problem population. So you've got this number of deer that are on the island, right? The t is variable time. What is the growth rate of deer? Here's a very naive uh, model for growth rate of deer on What is this? The units of this is dy dt. What are the units of this deer per time? Change of deer with respect to time. Uh, What should the growth rate be? Well, very naively, I would say that it is proportional to k times the number of deer. The more deer on the island, the more romance there is, and they make little baby deer. And so the growth rate should be proportional to how many are there. Lots of deer, lots of breeding, less deer, less breeding, right? This is a very naive model because it doesn't take into account a lot of things. Are there wolves on the island eating up the deer? Do they reproduce so much that they eat all the plants? Right? There, there's things, but this is actually just probably better for flies, right? Because they seem to not care about anything except reproduce, right? But this is where a differential equation might come up. We have an unknown function, y, whose derivative is a multiple. You might think of a function that has that property. Let me, let me take the k out of the equation here. You think of a function in these variable t's, talk about the deer population here. Can anybody think of a function? Um, can anybody think of a function? When I take the derivative, I just get the function back. What's that? Yeah, that's right. I was waiting for somebody to say zero. 
maybe it's a smart other answer for this today, but your exact your your one is better. If the deer are on the island and there's no limits to breeding, and they've got all the food they need, there's no predators, whatever, then one might expect to grow exponentially. This is what happens with bacteria. Uh, by the way, what about this? This is a good sort of exercise. Thank you, Dr. So now I, I get a little twist here. Over here, table is one. I had a function whose derivative is exactly the function. Now I want a function that when I take its derivative, it actually multiplies the function that I take. What's that? That's a, that's a really good idea. But the problem is this function is the same thing. It's not multiplied by k, right? Because that k is still here along with y. I mean, okay. There you go. Good, good, good. Very good. How about this? Now the derivative is multiplied by k, right? So clever. This is kind of another antiderivative thing here. And actually, uh, if you didn't see exponential growth in the k, in the of itself, this is a good model, at least for a small amount of bacteria in the petri dish, for a growth rate of bacteria. They just sit there and they reproduce, say, every half hour or something, right? And their growth rate is proportional to the the more bacteria are in the jar, the more they can split into two, right? Um, there's also a decay model, too, for how many of you know how radioactive decay works, or at least on some, right? So what happens is, is if you start with a big slag of radioactive stuff, how many of you have heard of half-life, right? What that means is I've got, let's say I've got a pound of radioactive material. After the half-life, whatever it is, it's 100 years. After 100 years, I should have about a half a pound of radioactive material. Another 100 years, I've got a quarter of a pound. Another 100 years, I've got an eighth. And it, there's always a little left over, right? But it gets smaller and smaller, right? It's sort of like, have you ever gone to the beach and got sand in your shoes, right? It, that sand is always there, right? It gets less and less, but there's always one more grain. It's, it's, I always think of that with the radioactive decay. Um, the amount of decay rate of the radioactive material is proportional to the amount there, right? When I have the full pound, it dropped by half a pound in that first hundred years. Now, when I've only got a half a pound, it only dropped by a quarter of a pound. So the decay rate is proportional to the amount there. So this actually shows up uh, here as well. Um, here's another differential equation. Uh, But um, P, the uh, portions, I like this, of population that has her group. Uh, one model of it. And so, how many of y'all heard rumors passed around before? Right? At first, somebody starts the rumor, nobody knows it. But then there's some point in the middle where, you know, everybody's, you know, it's on the TV and, you know, it's all over the place. And then after a while, most people know the rumor and spread and it dies down. So, the idea is the change of proportion of people. That know this rumor is proportional to the product 
of the proportion of people that know it and the proportion of people that don't, right? For a rumor to spread fast, you got to have two things happen. You got to have to have enough people to spread the rumor, and you got to have enough people out there that don't know the rumor that you can spread it to, right? And so now we're looking for an unknown function. Um, call it P, and its derivative is a multiple of P times one minus. Notice that when the proportion is near zero, so remember maybe almost hasn't started yet, then this number right here is very close to zero, right? The P is almost zero. So you change almost nothing, right? Because there's not there's not many people spreading the room. When almost everybody knows this room, then P is near one. And this term is almost zero. That means the rumor is spreading slow again. Because I come up and I tell you this juicy rumor. You say, oh, I heard that, right? I didn't spread it, right? It spreads the fastest right in the middle, where sort of half the people don't uh, know it and half the people do. That's another example of differential equation. And this is one of the reasons why when you take how does the requirements work here at one CP? You have to take 2060, 2028. Yeah, I think that maybe you do, but I'm here to tell you that the, the 1080 that you all are going to take in fall, 1080 is the most important part for 28. In fact, you're probably pretty much where they pulled out of that. How do you perform the middle? And I can adjust this by $18. Anybody, can you put a uh, function that satisfies the picture of your equation? And I'll steal the zero does, right? This is a function that when you add it to its own second derivative, zero. If the function is zero, then the second derivative is zero. Can anybody think of a exotic function that when you add it to its second derivative, you get zero? So, in other words, another way to think of this is when I take two derivatives of it, I just change the sign of the function. How can you get in? This is sometimes called the wave equation. That is correct. Cosine works as well. What happens if I take two derivatives of sine? Sine, cosine, negative sine. I start with cosine, cosine, negative sine, negative cosine. So this comes up actually in the propagation of waves. Okay. Um, let me do a differential equation that you might have seen. How, how, how many of you, when you first did derivatives, you did things like dropping rocks off the cliff, right? They, they give you some equation. And they say, oh, I threw this rock off a cliff, uh, find its velocity after three seconds, things like this, right? I want to derive this thing from scratch using antithetical. Okay, so. Uh, planet with constant gravity. Uh, what I mean by constant gravity is at the surface, it's got a constant acceleration, just like on Earth. How many of you know that the acceleration of gravity is? Uh, minus 32 p per second per second, or minus 9.8 meters per second, or whatever units you are, right? So I'm going to call this gravitational acceleration g. Okay. I throw a ball up at constant speed at Uh, B zero uh, from initial height S is zero. 
response. So here's my model, right? So here I am. So my initial height is S zero, and here I am. I throw this ball up in the air with initial velocity V zero. And I want to know a uh, function that tells me at what height this thing is. So this requires very little physics. Uh, in fact, almost none. In fact, the math really doesn't speak for you. My acceleration, uh, well, let's, so what I'm looking for is I'm looking for height equation. I'm going to call this S T and velocity V of T. Now, what does this have to do with antiderivatives? Uh, ST, that measures height of the ball above the surface of my planet. Uh, so it starts at height S0, the height of my planet. So, okay. What is ST measured in? Uh, feet. Meter, mile, some unit of physics, right? What the of T? What's the units of that? Miles per hour, feet per second, right? It's distance per time. And what's the relationship? Right, you all remember this the velocity is a change in position, right? It's the instantaneous rate of change in position, right? Change of feet with respect to time, right? And then you have this other thing called acceleration. That's feet per second per second. That is the change in velocity with respect to time, right? That's why. When I drop this marker, it picks up speed, it's changing, right? When I let go, if you take a camera right then, it's velocity zero, but by the time it hits the ground, it's going noticeably quicker. Okay, so what is, uh, what's the relationship between A, T, A of T, B of T? Okay. This is the change in velocity. So it's two derivatives. Um, actually, everybody agree with that? That's all we need. Right there, that is all we need. Because this is an exercise in antimatter. What do we know? We know that A of T is equal to G, whatever my gravitation is. That's a constant number. And this is T prime. So how, so I have V prime of T as number. How do I get velocity? When you get velocity, I, I don't want a derivative of this. I want an antiderivative. Uh, but to get velocity, it's the antiderivative of this. And what's the antiderivative of G? G times T, because G is just a number. And don't forget, again, we have a constant. Because it's not just GT, it's G But our problem gives me information to figure out what C1 is. Notice when I start the clock, what is the velocity of my ball? Well, it's, uh, it's actually D0, right? Now, what happens when I plug in zero to this thing? I get zero plus C1. 
So I get a new improved velocity. That equation gives me the velocity uh, of the ball uh, at any time. Now remember, G is probably negative, but I'm just going to just pull it down. You might ask yourself, when is the velocity zero? Minus d zero and e uh, velocity zero, right? And remember, g is probably negative constant, so it's positive. What does that signify? The velocity being zero. What happens when the velocity? Is zero? It's it's at its apex, right? It's, it's high. Now, I've got velocity. This is S prime of the So to get S of T, the position that I was looking for, this is the antiderivative of S of T. What is the antiderivative of GT? Don't let the G flow. Get G just a moment. What is the antiderivative of C? One half T squared times G. So it should be one half T squared for that T. So you can check this. I think the derivative is two to Plus B zero T plus constant two. But we've also got more information in the problem that tells us what this is. S of zero, that's the initial height of the object. Let's say the top of the plane. And what happens when I plug in zero to this? I get zero, zero, C. So finally, I get S T is one half G T squared is B zero T plus S T. This gives me a nice point. This will give you the projectile motion of any ball that I've tossed vertically up in the air. Uh, and this works on any planet. You put the gravity's constant, right? This works on the moon. This will work well. I'm not sure if I do, but it's to do. But any solid planet where you've got a constant um, uh, acceleration, if I throw it with velocity d zero and uh, start from a high velocity. So for example, so we've done many problems at once here. And see, antiderivatives, guys, how many of you have seen this equation? It's probably appeared earlier in your book, maybe in some homework problems or whatever. They'll say, oh, you know, if you throw a ball up, it'll give you an equation. Like this, this is where it comes from. Somebody just did some antiderivatives. So, for example, a concrete example. On Earth, uh, I am on a building uh, that's uh, 28 feet high and costs a ball upwards at 64. Second, uh, uh, how long for the ball? Uh, what the max height? 
and with this ball in the ground. And what is this velocity? So, on Earth, I'm on a building 48 feet high. I toss the ball upwards at 64 feet per second. What's the maximum height that ball goes to? Where does the ball hit the ground? How fast is it going to hit the ceiling? I can answer all of those questions with the thing that I built with the man time. In this case, before I get carried away here, what is G on Earth? And I'm, I'm going to do this. I remember what the acceleration is right It's a negative 32 feet per second squared. Um, I've got some other letters to plug in. What's V0? Yeah, it's 64 because it's a V0 is 64 feet per second. And S0, that's your 48. So, my height above the ground is given by S of T is equal to uh, minus 16 T squared plus 64 T plus 48. If you look in, if you look in uh, uh, earlier in your calculus book, you'll play a problem like this. You'll see the number negative, negative sixteen show up, or negative four point nine. So they're in either the English or the metric system units. And they're doing this on Earth. Okay, and while I'm at it, this. My velocity is just the derivative of my position function. So I throw my ball up. Notice this kind of makes sense because when I start the clock at 64 feet per second, I've popped it up, which is what I said. Um, my first question is uh, where's the max height of the ball? That's the thing that tells me what the height is. But to be able to effectively use that, I need something to plug in for T. Tell me the height. What do I plug in for T? Right. So, what is true about the velocity of my ball when it hits the maximum height? It's at zero. So, T of T equals zero times 32 T is four. So I get T equals two. Yeah, that's kind of humbling, isn't it? But I can throw it at 64 feet per second and it's dead stop in two seconds. So maximum height. Is S2, which is going to be a 16 times 4, that's going to be minus 64 plus 1.8 and 112. So that's the maximum height. When does the ball hit the ground? How do we deal with that? This was kind of in reverse because 
For this one, I needed the time and the velocity of zero to give me my maximum quantity. What does it mean to the ball that hit the ground? Like your height equals zero. Zero, sorry, zero minus sixteen squared, sixteen fourteen twenty eight. I'm going to divide by negative sixteen, so I'm going to have to deal with these numbers. E squared minus fourteen plus three. That's three. Uh, that would be minus. And that's less than two. T squared minus 14 minus 3. So I get E is 4 plus or minus the square root of 16 and 12, 8, And that's going to be 4 plus 7, 2 plus or minus 7. Uh, which which root do I take? Plus or minus? And why? Well, actually, it's plus because it's four and half. So. The square root of seven is somewhere between two and three, right? So in particular, if you take the negative here, that's gonna be a negative time. That's before I started. If I start this time equal zero. Uh, in fact, if you think about what's happening, the height goes like this, and I started at 48. This is back in time if you run the same type of time. So really what you want to see uh, being the top square root. And what's the velocity when it hits the ground? It's just this, whatever the step is. B uh, minus 32 times 2 plus radical 7 plus 6 plus 1. This is what we get minus 32 radical 7. That would be 54 seconds. So that's between 64 and 96. Probably say. Um, Uh, like maybe like roughly 80 feet per second. Notice the negative signifies the fact that it's falling down. Okay, any questions on that? So look over at the antiderivatives. I'm going to ask you. Potentially, so I'll put it to you this way. It's fair game for the test. Um, but the antiderivative really we're going to focus more on. I feel like you understand at least what's going on about that. I mean, it's just the derivatives in reverse. Kind of that. So we're going to be using that extensively later. Uh, if you take the square root of 32, don't get it. Okay, uh, any questions? All right, so let's.